And it's just such a pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague and more importantly for me, a dear, dear uh, friend, Stacy Bell. Stacy Bell was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. After uh, attending Oxford College, she received a BA in English from Warren Wilson College in North Carolina and an MS in Applied Linguistics from Georgia State University. After completing her master's, Ms. Bell taught English to adult refugees and immigrants in Atlanta before joining the faculty at Oxford in 1994 as a specialist in English for speakers of other languages. She is the director of multilingual writing and English placement. She advises faculty in best practices and inclusive pedagogies for non-native English speakers. She certainly has been a consultant to me through the years. She teaches a special topics theory practice course each spring on reading and writing personal narrative, which meets throughout the semester in a maximum security women's prison. She serves on the advisory board uh, to the project, to the Chillin Project, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, Stacy, an Associate of Arts program at Arendelle State Prison, administered uh, under the Center for Compassion, in Integrity, and Secular Ethics at Life University. She is an active and passionate advocate for prison reform and several of her courses address the problems of mass incarceration from multiple perspectives. On a personal level, again, she has changed so many of my students' lives and, and their perspectives regarding incarceration. She also has long been an active and passionate advocate for reforms of many other kinds, including efforts to address gender inequities. And last year, Emory's Center for Women recognized her work in this area with the 2019 Award for Excellence in Teaching and Pedagogy, citing in particular her willingness to bring gender issues into the classroom in creative and inspiring ways. Oxford College has been lucky to have Stacy Bell as yet another instance of a special college circumstance, the fact that a significant number of our alums have returned to the campus to assume positions on the faculty and staff. It's such a pleasure once again to introduce Stacy Bell. Thank you, Patty. That was so kind. And you, I'm just sitting here right now thinking about how much I miss you <laughs> and how I'm going to survive without you. And I see several other familiar faces, too. And I really appreciate you all um, joining in today um, to be part of this. So I'm going to just add a couple of things to um, that introduction because I, I realized that I need to make a couple of updates. I started to go inside the prison back in 2010. I, I had done inside out training, um, which is a program outside of Temple University that prepares college faculty to take their students, their outside students into a prison to have a collaborative classroom. I did that training in 2009 and, and I knew it was something that I was ready to do, but I, I had no idea how I was gonna make that happen. So fortunately, my husband McQuaid, um, who recently retired from Oxford, had um, many years been going into various prisons around Metro Atlanta, and he knew one of the heads of chaplaincy, Susan Bishop. And thanks to her and my colleague Liz Bounds at the Candler School of Theology, I was able to start going into Metro Prison in Atlanta with my Oxford College students to do this collaborative experience. And I was going to do that every spring, but then the governor decided to close Metro Prison. So that was a problem because there were a lot of programs happening there because it was very easy to access from the Oxford campus. Um, the Candler School of Theology Certificate in Theological Studies was based there as well. The women, um, or I should say the individuals who were incarcerated, they were mostly removed up to Lierendale, which is in Alto. It's a little over an hour from downtown Atlanta. It's 86 miles one way from Oxford campus. But in 2013, I regrouped and I started to go back into the prison with my Oxford students, but it was a very different experience because of the distance. 
So um, the reason I'm telling you this is because over the years of going in and meeting various people doing various forms of programming, I got to know the, um, some of the people who were the architects for the Shalon Project at Life University. Apparently, the president of Life University really, really wanted to start a program inside of a prison in Georgia and made the resources available for that to happen. And it was actually several Emory-affiliated Emory graduates who worked to design that new curriculum. It is currently a bachelor in positive psychology. The students who are enrolled will work towards the completion of a bachelor's degree. We already offer the associate's degree, and I'm proud to say that two cohorts of students have earned their associate's degree already inside of Lear and Dell State Prison. So I was hired to be adjunct faculty in that program. I've been in that program since 2017. I taught the very first quarter, January 2017. So I teach in that program, and it's also become a research interest for me, and um, I'm also, as a result, very connected in a broader community of prison um, educators and activists in Atlanta. And I'm going to talk to you about that towards the end. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen. And just full disclosure, um, I am not a genius at PowerPoint. I made a very basic one because I had some information I wanted to share with you today. So that's what we're going to look at. OK. So the title for today was Teaching in the Odd House, What the Prison Classroom Has Taught Me About Compassionate Pedagogy. I want to just take a second to talk about the title. I used this title a few years ago when I wrote a piece for one of the Emory publications about um, my work teaching inside of a carceral classroom. And it was really an interesting um, conversation. I was actually down at a manual facility, which is in Sw I had gone for a while to do some weekend workshops with some Emory colleagues. It's a minimum moderate security facility designated for women. And we were doing some um, writing exercises. And one of the students was telling a story about um, coming south. She's not originally from the south. And she was staying with some relatives who had an old fashioned outhouse on their property and she asked them what it was and they told her it was the outhouse but she heard odd house and she never forgot that and it stuck with me because I was sitting there thinking and this place we're in right now is also kind of an odd house and it's kind of become like a metaphor for me of of how I think about being inside of these total institutions when I go inside. So before we get started, I want to just say a couple of things about some of the um, best practices that I try to follow and some um, information that might help contextualize some of the language that I use. So I borrowed language from the Alliance for Education in Prison, which is our professional organization. And um, they say, we are challenging stereotypes and stigmas surrounding people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, including shifting away from polarizing and or dehumanizing language. So we believe that it's important to use person first language. An example of that would be to say people experiencing car incarceration, but you can say incarcerated people, incarcerated students, etc. We try to avoid using the language of the state or the institutional language. Offender is a particularly problematic word. Inmate is an institutional word that we avoid. Um, words like criminal, um, perpetrator, these are labels that are othering and stigmatizing and we try to avoid that language. It does take some work, but if you really practice it, you'll eventually get the hang of it. You probably also notice if you read regularly about these issues of mass incarceration that even in some of our more left-leaning and progressive publications, journalists and writers still haven't been able to make this shift. The Alliance had a conversation with the Marshall Project a few years ago about it because they refused to stop using the stigmatizing language. They said it ultimately doesn't matter, but it does matter. 
it really does matter the language to refer to people who are in prisons and jails. It's important to remember that they are people. And then second, the gender binary is imposed on carceral institutions by the state. Not all of the people who are incarcerated in prisons for men identify as men. And certainly not all of the people incarcerated in prisons for women identify as women. And we also know that LGBTQ plus individuals are arguably the most vulnerable population in our jails and prisons. That's not really gonna be at the, at the center of what I discussed today, but it's worth noting. And to be thinking about this gender binary, I know that in my program, many of the students that um, I have met and taught over the years do not identify as women. And so it's really important for us to remember that when we're talking about um, the people that um, we meet inside of these institutions. So a little bit of background. In 1965, the Higher Education Act under Lyndon Johnson made people in prison eligible for Pell Grants. And then some people argue that in the early 1970s, when you started to have these, these very visible and vocal uprisings like the Attica uprising, that that was a catalyst for bringing college and prison programs back into the institutions. So by 94, there were more than 350 college programs in prison across the country, including right here in Georgia. But then in 1994, Bill Clinton passed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, which is also known or more commonly known as the Crime Bill it eliminated Pell funding for students in prison. And so the programs went away almost overnight. The, those who have been um, practitioners for a long time have to remember it that way because the funding went away. By 2005, there were only 12 college programs in 12 prisons. And I've named a, a few here that stand out. Hudson Link in New York State is a um, collaboration. It's inside of Bedford Hills, which is designated for women, and Sing Sing, which is designated for men. Um, that's a very well-known program. And the Education Justice Project is at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Rebecca Ginsburg, who is a real leader in our field, that program. And then one that people have heard of is the Bard Prison Initiative started by Max Kenner. It's probably the best known of the programs. Um, and we might want to talk about that a little bit later. That's a little bit problematic because that's the one that people tend to know and focus on. But there are many, many other college and prison programs and they follow various models. They're not all like that one. So we might talk about that a little later too. Um, the Second Chance Act in 2008 provided some reentry funding and then some funding for college and prison. So this was when we saw the shift towards actually thinking about college and prison as a worthy endeavor and change in the hearts and minds of some of our legislators towards bringing back Pell funding. In the Second Chance Pell Experimental Sites Initiative, in 2016, that was a U.S. Department of Education initiative and under Barack Obama got a lot of attention because basically that was signaling that it was time to start providing Pell funding to prisoners again. In 2017, there were 63 sites, 63 colleges in 26 states were um, receiving this um, experimental Pell money to um, start building their programs and prisons. And then there was a second launch again in spring of 2020. There are now 130 Pell sites in 42 states and three here in Georgia, Central Georgia Technical, Georgia State University and Life University. And that's my program. We were very excited about this. So we're in the process right now of working with um, Vera, the Vera Institute in New York, and our other consultants on um, rolling this out. But now we have Pell funding for our program. It makes a huge difference. Georgia State University as well. So um, some background, some other, other things to think about. Higher ed and prison programs may or may not be credit or degree bearing. Um, you might have college faculty going in and teaching college level courses, but the students are not receiving any sort of credit or degree for it. That's actually what I started doing in 2010 when I went inside 
and I offered my memoirs course. And I wasn't offer my students any kind of credit, although I did try to collaborate with the Candler School of Theology and provide elective credit. That worked one time before Metro Prison closed. And after that, when I was not able to offer the equivalent of a, of a full semester college course, I would offer this a certificate. So I would print them out a really, really professional looking certificate of completion, and they could put that in their folders. And those sorts of um, certificates can be very helpful when an individual goes in front of a parole board, for example. Anything that shows that you completed something, you stuck with something, you did it, can be very useful. So I want to be very clear that just because a college instructor or a college course doesn't automatically lead to credit or a degree, that doesn't mean that it's not significant or useful or important. It is important. So most of these college programs that are emerging now are practicing on the consortium model. Most higher education and prison programs are staffed by faculty from multiple institutions in a region. It's really difficult to start a college and prison program and staff it entirely and fully by the single credit or degree granting institution. So Life University is giving the degree to the students at Lee Arendale, but the program has faculty from Oxford, me, and a number of faculty from um, Life University and also faculty from Georgia State and also faculty from Spelman. However, we don't have a consortium yet. We're working on that. We don't have the consortium yet, but it's something we're trying to build. It's almost impossible to do this otherwise. I'm really lucky. I would give a shout out here to my previous dean, Steve Bowen, and my current dean, um, Doug Hicks, and also Ken Anderson, because they've supported me in my work. And when Life University wanted to hire me as adjunct, I had to go to my deans and say, I'm not trying to moonlight or get away with something, but they need to hire me to do this. And I want to know if um, I have your permission, and they have been very supportive of me doing this. Under a consortium model, that wouldn't have to happen. Under a consortium model, I would be able to actually teach a class at the prison in load. It could count, for example, as part of my teaching load for the semester, and my salary is paid by my institution, Emory. Um, but we're not there yet. It's going to take some work to get there, and some of you may end up becoming advocates for this as well in the future. Um, one of the problems that we face in this field is that many programs have relied on volunteer faculty. Now, volunteering sounds like a really great thing to do. However, volunteering limits who can do this work. And then that leads to another deeper systemic problem that we care very much about, which is the um, overrepresentation of white faces in black and brown spaces. We know that Black and people of color are way overrepresented in our prisons and jails in this country. And it does matter who is in the classroom teaching them. So when you are trying to staff a program through volunteers, then basically you're gonna get people who have the time, the money, the resources to do the work on top of everything else they're doing, rather than bringing in people from the communities that are represented inside the prisons, which is really important. Um, about leadership. We also believe that program boards and directors should include directly impacted individuals. As much as possible in the field of higher education in prison, we want to bring people who start their education in prison, help them to complete their education, and if they are released from prison, once they become world citizens, so um, I made this graphic just to sort of try to summarize what I was saying about um, degree bearing versus non-degree bearing programs. In most um, prisons in the United States, um, people will have access to adult basic education or a general education degree, a general equivalency diploma. Um, and if they do, then they can qualify to go directly into a degree program in the prison if one is available. Sometimes they will do non-degree programs, um, which will then also prepare them to be in the higher education and prison program as well. 
Um, but what I really want to emphasize is that there are a lot of these typically run by volunteers, various forms of um, programs available. The Certificate in Theological Studies um, that's um, offered by Candler is an example of that. Um, but it's a very valuable program. What we found over the years is that the students get really great preparation for um, doing the college level reading and writing that's required of them. Many of our Shalon students are graduates of CTS, of the Certificate in Theological Studies. Another program in, a, in the Atlanta area that does similar work is Common Good, which you may have heard of. Um, they also offer college classes in four different, I think four different facilities around Atlanta, which um, also really, really prepare the students to then actually take the college classes if they're able to enroll in a program. So in this graphic, I just wanted to show you about um, the consortium that we're building. So GCHEP, Georgia Coalition for Higher Education and Prison, is a body that represents all of these different programs. Reforming Arts, which is a reentry um, program, Common Good Atlanta. We have an inside out instructor from um, the University of Georgia, who is a member of our group, um, Candler School of Theology, Georgia State University, and Life University. All of us are um, stakeholders in this program, and we're working to build a 501c3 organization will act as the consortium to put faculty in all of our various programs around um, Atlanta, Metro Atlanta and Georgia. All right, I'm switching over here to an older presentation from a few years ago. I'm not gonna read all of these slides to you, but I just wanna talk a little bit about the work that I do and how it changed my thinking and how it has changed everything I do as a professor at Oxford um, and also in, in Life University as well. Um, this was a collaboration with a person who was incarcerated at the time, who is now a free world citizen. Um, one of the um, students in my first cohort at Life. And we presented at our conference in 2017, talking about the differences between the free world classroom and the prison college classroom. And um, a shout out to my friend and colleague, Jessica Cates, for coming up with this paradigm, the privilege industry versus the punishment industry. So when I'm teaching a class on the Oxford campus, I think of myself as embedded in the privilege industry. I'm embedded in a program not only serves people who have enormous amounts of privilege, often, not always, but often, but also is a program that reproduces that privilege. It confers additional privileges on the people who have the opportunity to be in those programs. When you're inside a prison, you are inside the punishment industry because our prisons and jails really serve one function in our society today, and that is to punish. Now we could, we could argue that. That's also not the topic of this um, presentation, and I'll say more about it, but it certainly is the conclusion that I have reached based on my experience. Okay, so what can an education do within the context of the punishment industry? This is the question that my students and I began to ask and really think hard about. And it's, this, it's the question that continues to drive my research and my thinking. What is the value of this program when it's taking place inside of, a, of an institution, a total institution that seeks to punish and really that works against our goals in every way possible? So prison education provides students who are incarcerated a sense of agency, tools for expression and navigating the system, tools for upward mobility, new lenses for viewing everything in the world. Um, we believe in education for education's sake. Um, entering into the conversation, which is what, what writing teachers are trained to do, is help students to enter the conversation through writing. Um, and inclusion and involvement in conversations inside and outside prison. Now, it's interesting to note that 
when those of us who are teaching in prison want to go to um, people who are not familiar with this work, oftentimes funders, um, legislators, people who are in a position to create more opportunity, often they will ask, well, why? Why are we giving a college education to bad people, to people who have done harm or to criminals? And so some research has been done. Um, in the last several years, the Vera Institute in New York and um, other agencies and individuals have looking at the value of a college education. And what we know is that students who engage in college and prison um, have a very, very diminished chance of, or likelihood of recidivating. So if they leave prison, the chance that they will return to prison is dramatically reduced from about a 60% chance within three years to about a 4% chance if they have a college degree. Okay, so the numbers speak for themselves, right? Um, you want people to stay out of prison and become productive members of the society they're living in, and we know that a college degree will do that, okay? But we also know that in many of our programs, some of our students are never leaving because we have life without parole in many states in this country, including Georgia. And we have students in our program at Lee Arendale who may never leave prison or aren't gonna leave for a really long time. But we're still offering them this, this education because we believe in it, because it's a privilege. And we believe that anybody who seeks it should have access to it. These are guiding principles in the work that we do. So I was mentioning to you that I teach comp one and two at Lee Arendale, and it's very similar to the way I teach first year writing at Oxford. Sorry, my bad, my phone just went off. Um, it's very similar to the way I teach first year writing at Oxford because you know I'm trying to offer the same um, privilege and opportunity bearing experience to my incarcerated students that I would offer to my free world students. But what I realized in that first year of teaching inside of prison is that the things I did on the outside don't always translate on the inside and vice versa. And I had to start really rethinking a lot of the things that I was doing. And that's where I'm going with the type of presentation when I say that teaching in prison has made me a more empathetic teacher. I would like to think that it changed the way I view my students in every context and that it has changed the way I'm approaching them in the classroom, and I hope improving the quality of the instruction that I'm offering them. Um, one of the things that we help students to do when we offer them this education is to negotiate on the inside. A lot of no negotiation is required when you live inside of a prison all day, every day, um, and we're giving them the tools that they need to do that, writing skills, oral presentation skills, critical thinking skills, and also the ability to critique the system that they're in. Now, we have to do that carefully, obviously, because there can be real pushback against that. Because what do we say that a liberal arts education does? We say that it's liberating. We say that it frees your mind from parochial thinking. and. Prison administrations don't want a bunch of free thinking people incarcerated in their institutions. And yet, that's what we're seeking to do unapologetically. All right, we're gonna offer them the same critical thinking skills and encourage that as we would with students on the outside. Um, we also have learned inside that we have to be super flexible in our teaching. You know, you want to have rules and have control in your classroom. When you're working in a prison, the prison controls you. I think that's a really good lesson for a college professor, is to know that you don't always get to be in control. Um, I learned over the years that every class that I held with my students inside prison was a gift. So I stopped really thinking far ahead into the future, and I noticed 
this change happening to me on the Oxford campus as well. Every time I would show up to a class, I would think, okay, here we are. What are we gonna do right now? What matters in this moment? How do we make the most of this time we have together? Because being in prison has taught me, you don't always know if your class is gonna meet. You don't know when you'll be able to meet your class. There could be something going on in the prison that causes everybody to be shut down. I taught in prison for the last time on March 12th, and I have not seen my students since then because of COVID. And I don't know when I'll see them again. I have no idea when I will. And so those kinds of disruptions are commonplace and we learn to work within them. Um, when we're inside of prison, we have limited access to the kinds of materials and resources that we take for granted on the outside. The students actually have laptops, but everything is whited out except for Wikipedia and a few other um, vetted spaces that they can have access to. They don't get to do their research the way outside students do. So we have to learn to really be much more fluid and much more flexible and really rethink what it means to um, be achieving a set of goals. I tend to be much less um, outcomes oriented and much more process oriented now as a result of doing this work. Also, support systems are not there. So teaching at Oxford, my students have so many support in place. They have career counseling, counseling, psychiatric health and help, you know, a really well-staffed clinic to meet their basic health needs. They get help with math, with their writing. They can learn from each other. They have access to their faculty almost 24 hours a day, depending on who the faculty member is. And when you're teaching inside of prison, that, that, that's not there. It's much more difficult access your students from the outside, it's more difficult for them to access their faculty. And so we learn to really think about what it means to do college without those traditional supports in place. And it makes me also much more grateful for the supports that I have in my free world classroom. So I didn't take this picture out of here. I debated whether or not to show it. Don't tell anybody you saw this picture. This is one of, um, one of our student cohorts and they put this picture in the PowerPoint because they wanted you to see them, to know who they are. Um, this is our first cohort in the Life University program who earned their, um, their associate's degree in 2018 and they are now working towards their bachelor's degree. So teaching on both sides of the wall, um, these are some of my conclusions. I'm gonna finish up fairly soon and then I'm gonna um, ask you to ask me some questions. So now that I teach in two very different contexts and I am very committed to this, this mission, this project of higher education in prison, I've learned that the functions of higher education are really complex. And I've turned my own critical eye to the institution that I work in. And I'm not just talking about Emory and Oxford, but I'm talking about the university in general. And I've started to ask questions about what the university does. What is the role of the university in our society? What does it do? And one of the things that the university does, like I said earlier, is it confers status, it reproduces status and privilege and confers status and privilege on those who participate in it. And so I think about that because it's available to everybody. Even in the free world, not everybody can get access to higher education. So the question I have here, what is inclusivity in an institution that is inherently exclusive? This is another question that I think about a lot. Inclusivity is one of our buzzwords. Diversity and inclusivity are two of the um, values that we claim are really important in the university. That we want to have diverse student bodies, diverse curricula, diverse faculty, and that we want to be inclusive of many different stakeholders. And we are, but to a prison classroom, you realize that inclusivity can only extend so far. 
um, prison educators have to be really careful about not reproducing oppressive structures. This is very important to those of us in, in this work, um, my colleagues here in Georgia and beyond, because some of the things that we do in the traditional classroom are oppressive in ways that we might not think about. For example, the honor council, the honor code, um, giving grades. Sometimes these are things that we consider to be normal and um, benign, but when you are inside of a prison classroom, you learn to look at um, structures in different ways. Prison is a punishing place. Um, the stakes are very, very high for our students all the time. They are always at risk of getting in trouble for something, of losing their access. And so when I encounter a student, let's say I think the student has in some way violated the rules for the class. Um, and I've seen it happen. If I was on the Oxford campus, I wouldn't necessarily think twice about submitting a student to the Honor Council and saying, well, you violated academic integrity. You've, you've cheated or you've plagiarized or something. In prison, the stakes are much higher, okay? On the Oxford campus, if a student is found guilty of a violation, they may fail the class, um, but they're allowed to stay in the program. It, it could be a lot different outcome for a student inside of a prison. So I've had to start really thinking differently about the kinds of interventions that I do with students when I see some, maybe a suspected violation. Um, we also ask questions about our curriculum in our classrooms. Is our pedagogy and is our curriculum decarceral and decolonial? In other words, are we offering classes and readings and texts and materials that are relevant to the lives of our students in the prison classroom? Do we offer them classes that allow them to read and critique and think about and learn about other scholars who look like them, other scholars who have similar background? Are we presenting traditional material in a new way? that allows them to critique and, and ask these important questions. Another question that we ask is, can higher education in prison change the university? So with more and more of these programs, can we start to change the landscape of the free world university and the free world classroom as well? Um, by more and more of our former students into the academy, those who leave prison with a degree or who complete their degree on the outside can go on to faculty and staff and administrators and bring their unique perspective with them. And then finally, something that you all might find really interesting to think about, and I've been thinking about it a lot since March. I was not teaching, I was on sabbatical leave during spring semester, and that was very fortunate for me because I understand that it was very hard. But, I was um, paying attention to what was happening and reading all of the news about higher education. And after all of the classes went online, um, one thing that happened across the country was that faculty were encouraged to be kind, to consider a trauma-informed approach to teaching the students who were traumatized by the pandemic, by the sudden shift to online learning, by being forced to move home. Some students moved home and um, were going to places that were not necessarily safe for them, that were not necessarily good places for them to continue studying. And it made me ask the question along with my colleagues, if the kindness approach is reserved for crises, then what approach characterizes our usual classroom interactions and expectations? And if we're not taking a trauma-informed approach or practicing the pedagogy of kindness under normal circumstances, then what are we practicing? And why wouldn't we practice a pedagogy of kindness all the time, regardless of where we are? Free world classroom, carceral classroom, pandemic, no pandemic. And just to give you an example of what that looked like, this, this um, article was viral back in April in the New York Times. Um, I put a link in here. I hope it's going to work. 
It's like it's going to take a second. But the title was interesting. College made them feel equal. The virus exposed how unequal their lives were. And it looks like it's not opening. Um, it might in a second. But just think about what that title tells us. College made them feel equal. The virus exposed how unequal their lives were. So I'm teaching inside of prison where we know that we have students who have suffered many and many deprivations in their lives and who are also trying to get an education in adverse circumstances. And we forget about the fact that in our free world classrooms, many of our students also come from backgrounds um, that have been trauma inflected. They may have experienced many harms in the past and they bring all of that with them. Um, and we forget about that, I think, because we don't necessarily see it. And what the pandemic did was to remind us that we can be attentive to all of the various needs of our students, even in our free world classrooms, even on a very privileged campus like the Oxford campus. Just because we are offering um, this elite education in an elite context, that doesn't mean that all of our students have come from the same background and it's important to remember that. That's a really huge lesson for me that teaching in prison has taught me and made me aware of. So I think I've probably come to the end of my slides. I'm gonna make sure. Here are um, a few um, quotes that I wanna end with. So Renietta Lodge is the author of Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. I recommend this book if you're interested in um, doing some anti-racist reading. She is a British, um, a black British author. She says, quote, I don't want to be included. Instead, I want to question who created the standard in the first place, which I think really sums up um, the kind of critical thinking we do in the prison classroom where we are looking at the standards that have been created for us in higher education and we're critiquing them and we're asking if we can create new standards. Um, if we aren't intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. Um, very well-known legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who created the term intersectionality, which asks us if we want to change the society, change the university. That's my closing remark. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to questions. Okay, and following our standard procedure, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, just raise the blue hand. Uh, you reach that by clicking on participants and there's a blue hand at the bottom. So Brenda Bynum has a question. Okay. Yes, uh, Kerry Bonham. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, quick question. Um, part of the curriculum for uh, this the program is uh, has the element personal uh, narrative. Seems like to me that would be a really important part of this curriculum. And I wonder how that has what form that has taken and what are some of the implications of personal narrative from the students? Okay, that's a, that's really a great question. Um, so actually, the class that I taught independently during the spring, taking my Oxford students into the prison for a collaborative classroom, that that is English 389R memoir. And that's the class in which the students read and write personal narrative. And I want to um, tell you very briefly about the, the um, project that the students do in that class. So over the course of the semester, they read memoir and they also work on their own personal narrative project. And then they also have a collaborative project. So one Oxford student is paired with one Lee Arendelle student and they have to 
tell a narrative about their partner in the first person. Mm -hmm. I did not create this idea. I got it from the New York Times from um, reading a story about two schools in, um, in the Bronx that were doing this project. So that means that one student who is incarcerated gets to take on the voice of the free world student. The free world student gets to take on the voice of the incarcerated student. And then we put those stories together in a binder and everybody gets to keep a copy of it. And it's, it's turned out really well. It's been a, a great um, project because um, as one student said one year, it really helps you get past social location, right? So when you go into prison, you see people in their khaki uniforms, it says Department of Corrections or State Prisoner. And you're gonna make a whole lot of assumptions about that person based on what you see. And then this process of narrative writing and telling each other's stories makes you realize there's another person there. There's much more to the person than just the label, the uniform, and also the fact that they're living in prison. Does that answer the question? Absolutely, thank you. Okay, and then Viola Westbrook. Um, my question was somewhere at the beginning, you juxtaposed um, the goals at the free world uh, college and the um, in prison. And you said in prison, our goal is to um, teach uh, citizenship or to teach citizens. And I'm wondering if that's not the fundamental goal of every ed higher education is to uh, prepare people for citizenship. So I'm not quite sure why that ju juxtaposition, or maybe you can explain it a little bit more to me, because I thought that goal for the prison in prison was marvelous and just right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's another really great question too. Um, I don't want to be too terribly provocative because I, I know that I, I know that I can be very provocative at times, but I will say um, I'm not sure that prepare, training or teaching or preparing citizens is always the goal of, of an education. I think it should be, but I think that a lot of what is happening these days, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at any, at any level of education, K through 12, college, private, public, it doesn't matter. Um, some people would argue it's increasingly about credentialing. It's increasingly just about giving people the credentials they need to get certain kinds of jobs. And that this other really important dimension of education, which is to prepare citizens to think critically, is not necessarily the most important goal. And we really believe in the prison classroom, in my program in particular, that the critical thinking that really think about our institutions is very important. And you see it across all of the classes that, that we offer. And you know, I try to do it in my Oxford classes as well. I'm trying to give students something provocative that challenges them so that they're developing those critical thinking skills that they need to be productive citizens. I found that to be so very important today. And actually, I think it is in every mission statement of uh, every higher education institution. So I, I, I guess what I was hinting at is we need to get back to doing a lot more citizenship education, I think, in our broader higher education programs. So I appreciate your answer. And I'm excited to hear that, what you're doing. And, and I really found your presentation wonderfully informative and a lot to think about. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, Rosemary McGee. Stacey, thank you so much. It was a very compelling uh, discussion and it also makes um, many of us, for me at least, want to contribute or participate in some way to these, these kinds of efforts. Um, uh, but my specific question is similar to Carrie's, um, but uh, I was wondering about the narrative part, but I'm also curious, uh, I, I'm assuming that you're also reading other kinds of narratives, not just, not, not solely the students reading um, 
um, their work and sharing their own writings. Um, and I would be interested to know if you would share that reading list with us, you know, um, after this session or email it to those of us who are interested, or whatever you and Gray work out, because I'd be curious to see um, what people are reading and how they're thinking and, and to try to imagine myself, uh, not only what I'm thinking, but how others um, in a very drastically different circumstance um, might be thinking or reading about those same materials, some of which I'm sure I'm already familiar with, but others I might not be. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I can try to compile a list of the of the memoirs that I've used over the years. And, um, and I'll put a few that I haven't taught yet that I'm looking forward to. And I'll also mention one of the classes that I teach in the Shalon Project um, in that curriculum. That curriculum has two novels courses. Um, I guess we would think of them as English literature courses, but they're very, very specific. One is called Novels of Identity, and the other is called Novels for Social Change. And that's the course that I teach. I actually co-teach that with my husband, Mike McQuaid. That has been a very interesting experience for us. He's a sociologist by training. And so we had a lot of fun figuring out how to do this. And one of the things that we did that was really important is go to the students and let them help design the course because giving them that agency is really important and also the input, finding out from them what kinds of things would they like to read about, what would be interesting. So we offered some options, they came up with some options. And one of the books that we've read is Native Son by Richard Wright for that class. Um, we read um, Sing Unburied Sing by Jessamyn Ward. And another book that they chose is Black Like Me, um, which some of you may remember. Um, the author, and the name is escaping me, I'm sorry, it's Griffith or Griffin. Um, it's not even really, it's more like a memoir, but he, he um, had his skin darkened so that he could pass as a black man back in the 1960s and then he wrote about it. And so we choose these books and we have these guiding questions where we um, are asking, is this a novel for social change? Can a novel actually lead to social change? Are there some kinds of reading that could be so impactful that they could change the way we think or that they could have a real impact on the society? Um, and so that's, that's a really, really great class that I have enjoyed teaching. Um, and I'd be happy to put together a list of those books. And on. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stacey. This is Gray. I can't raise my hand since I'm a host, but um, I, I wanted to comment on one thing you mentioned that has been of, of great concern to me, and that is that universities, particularly like Emory, being places of privilege and uh, students being of uh, various backgrounds and so forth. And one one of the problems I think that a number of students have at institutions like Emory is coming from uh, relatively poor backgrounds and being surrounded by incredible wealth with the assumption that everybody is like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, the, uh, the college, uh, Emory College on the main campus started several years ago a program called something like the 1912 program, our scholars program. We're not sure what. It was really developed for first generation students because one sees this type of difficulty, particularly with first generation students who uh, frequently will come from um, backgrounds without a lot of money. And um, the, the dean in charge of that said that she had gotten a call from the parents of one of the students. And of course, the students have substantial amounts of financial aid, but the parents were saying that they didn't think they were going to be able to keep their student enrolled because it was so expensive. And so the dean was asking, well, what is, what is it that's so expensive? And she said, well, you know, 
my child is is eating out at all these restaurants and the dean said well what restaurants and so uh, the parents named some of the most expensive restaurants in atlanta and of course what was happening is that student was with some friends and they said well let's go out to eat and they were going out to these very expensive restaurants and so that put the student in a situation of either saying well i can't go because i can't afford that or else going and spending money that he didn't have. And I think so often we don't even appreciate that there are students on campus like that. And yet that's a typical experience, not just at Emory, but at all elite institutions, that students come from the backgrounds that we say we want to be included and that we want to reach out to and that are part of us, and yet experience a very challenging and unfriendly environment because of that. And I just wonder what reaction you have to that. I, I assume you've seen that at Oxford. Oh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's only been in the last few years that Emory College and Oxford College in an intentional way have started to, um, have started to respond to certain student needs that, you know, are not necessarily obvious. Um, I know for a fact that um, I think Emory College is um, trying to address the needs of food insecure students. And when I first heard this, I was thinking food insecure students at Emory, how would that be possible? Well, there are plenty of people in the community living off campus. Um, living in apartments who are not living in university housing and they don't necessarily have enough money to afford food. And another thing that Emory College and um, the Oxford campus both do is they now have um, a closet, like a community closet for students who are maybe doing an interview for a scholarship or an internship or they need to go do a presentation and they need presentable clothing. And so the campuses have put together these closets where students can go and check out what they need because they don't have dress clothes to do this. And that's more common than you would think. Thank you. I think that's a, a, that's a problem that goes so much unrealized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and John? Um, when you teach classes in prison, is there some prison staff present uh, overseeing, you know, what you're doing or what the uh, your students are up to? And if so, uh, I would find it very interesting whether the warden or whoever is there to supervise picks up on some important ideas themselves that they hadn't really thought of, you know, whether there's some spillover uh, from your teaching to the incarcerators. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is a great question. Thank you so much. I have um, two answers. My prison, um, where I'm teaching, Lee Arendale, is dramatically understaffed. Um, at the beginning of this year, when Kemp, or whenever it was that Kemp took office, he has um, reduced the corrections budget, I think, by 28%. And Lee Arendelle was already understaffed. So we don't have anybody in the classroom with us. Um, I never really have. There's usually an officer on the floor or hall, as we say. Um, and sometimes you'll see more than one when you come in. But the officer presence is very, very minimal for us just because they're, they just don't have enough staff. Um, second, the Shalom Project, one of the, the dimensions of this program that I really value, and again, this is the Life University program, is in addition to providing the degree to um, the students who are incarcerated, we also offer ships to staff at the prison. Interesting. That is really, really important, and we're really trying to signal that this education is valuable to all. And we don't want the staff to feel, you know, these people are in prison and they're getting something for free that we can't 
cannot afford on the outside. And so one way to kind of push back against that is to make this as inclusive as we possibly can. And we have had some staff take advantage of that, Scott. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jane, Sarah? Uh, all righty. What I, what I was asking is, what happens to the students if they are able to leave prison? Uh, how much does the stigma of their prison experience limit their opportunities to use this education? That is another great question. So we have four students um, on the outside who have already left prison prior to completing their bachelors. And so far, because it's a small number, um, we've been able to really um, stay in contact with them and, and work hard with them to um, support them on the outside. But one of the missions of the Georgia Coalition for Higher Ed in Prison is to do the wraparound reentry support that is really vital to people leaving prison who face enormous stigma um, as a result of having been incarcerated, even with a college degree even with some college, it can still be enormously difficult to overcome that stigma. So a lot of work still needs to be done in this area. Georgia doesn't necessarily have the robust reentry support that you find in many parts of the Northeast. Like New York has a lot of programming, but it's an area that um, really needs attention here in the Southeast. It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, Mary Ann? Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, I just want to follow on a comment by Rosemary about broader involvement and con contributing and things and thinking of things that are very enriching for a number of us retirees that are looking for connections with each other and intellectual stimulation. And one of those is a book club. And I just wondered if anybody had tried forming you know, just informal book clubs with prison, with, with incarcerated people um, to give them just a connection with regular people, not a course, but just to talk about a book and maybe get, you know, acquainted a little bit and maybe get together once a month and just have a, an informal discussion about what they think about a book. It seemed like it would be um, rewarding for both the outside people and the inside people. And has this ever been tried? Yeah, um, when I was talking before about the non-degree programs, um, their book clubs I think are pretty common inside of uh, reading groups. Right now they're not happening anywhere that I know of sure. um, because of COVID, but um, yeah, I did one one summer. I think the summer of 2010 or 11, I just did a book club at Metro and it was um, a lot of fun. I think I, I think it was, um, I think Bill and Pat Graves are next. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering, it seems to me in Patty's introduction, uh, uh, she mentioned uh, something about your background with ESL instruction. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and to what extent is that, uh, does that come up in the prison program? Are, are there a significant number of people or even any people for whom it's not only standard English, but any English is a, a second language? Are they are there non-native speakers? There, there must be some. And how does that work out? Yeah, that's another real question. Thank you for asking that one, because um, there definitely are non-native English speakers in prisons and jails across the country. And we do not have any second language English students in our program. There aren't very many incarcerated at Lee Arendale and they have applied um, to be in the program. And I, I don't know too much about the demographics of the other prison programs. I know that there are um, second language or, or non-native non English speakers in programs in other prisons but not in ours. And I know that in some parts of the country with really high numbers of um, non-native English speaking people that inside the prisons, the prisoners themselves, the people who are incarcerated will form language support groups 
And I've actually seen presentations on this at, at my conference that I attend every year. So it does happen, but it, it's not something that we are working on specifically in my program because the need is not there. Thank you. Thank you. And Larry Vogler. Yes, uh, my question is I've read that there's in general a, a scarcity of uh, books in prison libraries and I was one, and there, there are means of uh, donating books to prison libraries. I was wondering if uh, that's been your experience at the prison in which you work, and also if any books that you recommend for your students, do you have any, or any of them censored by the authorities there, or how does that work? Yeah, that's another really great question. Um, the censorship problem keeps popping up around the country at various programs. I have never been in the official library at Lee Arendale, and I, I don't know why, I just never have. It's, it's up the hill from the classroom building, and I've never been in it, but I used to go in the library at Metro pretty regularly, and we have a small library for the program. We have our own office, and, our, and we have two classrooms that belong to our program, and our library is quite small but then the students can go to the other main library. And the problem that we've encountered recently is that when people want to make big donations of books, that um, it can be hard for the prison staff to process them. And I don't know about censoring. Um, you might be kind of surprised to see some of the titles on the shelf in our Shalon office. Because a lot of us in the faculty bring our books in. We just bring ours in and, and they're there. Um, censorship is tricky. You know, it, it happens differently at different institutions. And as I mentioned before, um, Lee Arendelle is so understaffed. They don't, they don't really have anybody that's actually closely inspecting our materials when we come in with them. So can I just follow up that, to say mm -hmm. that... Uh, the AJC ran an article on uh, the scarcity of books in prisons, and uh, they listed the several of the prisons in Georgia, and the number of books per inmate varied from 1.3 to, I think the highest was 18 books per inmate. So uh, it is a big problem, it sounds like, and uh, I guess if space and personnel are the limiting factor, donating books won't help a whole lot. But but there, there was a, a phone number listed and a, 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 a email address for doing that. If anyone's interested, I can provide it. Uh, the person involved was Emmanuel Mitchell at uh, Georgia Department of Corrections. So, yeah, um, I'm really glad you asked because you were you just reminded me that I forgot to tell you all something super important, which is Georgia has a huge prison system. And I apologize for not putting that into context earlier. We have the fourth largest prison system in the country. I don't know if that's surprising. California, Texas, and Florida have bigger prison systems. And New York and Georgia had been sort of tied for a while. And now New York has decarcerated. And their prison system is actually quite a bit smaller than ours. We have 52,000 people incarcerated in prisons in Georgia and there are a lot of prisons all across the state and we're only offering um, college degree programs in about four of them. So yeah, you've got to imagine that the, um, the circumstances, the resources and many of the other institutions across the state are very limited. So the next question is Daniel Galena. Can you hear me Stacy? Yes. Okay, Stacy. my question is about outcomes, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You mentioned that the rate of reincarceration regularly is about 60%, and after the programs, it's about 4%. Is correct? That's right off the top of my head, and I might be a little bit off, but it is dramatically decreased. Okay, yes. but that means, that means that not only the inmates are punished, but also all the taxpayers in the country are punished. 
because the numbers are so, the outcome is so enormously different. And I understand the numbers of programs are very small in order to make a generalization, but um, it's basically it's an extraordinary number. And my other question for you, Stacy, is do you have any data or outcomes of comparison between your programs or your type of programs in the USA versus the other developed countries like Canada and Europe? So are you ta you're talking about our college and prison program? Correct. Yeah. Well, you know, these other countries incarcerate at such dramatically lower rates than we do also. Um, I don't have that, that data handy. I think that that's the kind of research that is probably happening right now, that the programs are kind of looking at these outcomes. Because as I did mention in the beginning, in higher education programs, is only very recently starting to grow, only in the last few years, um, because the funding has become available again. So this is the kind of research that is probably happening right now, but we don't necessarily have great data yet. One thing that we do know, based on these RAND studies, is that um, taking college classes in prison does dramatically reduce in recidivism for those who leave prison. That's what we do know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stacy. and I don't know if he's scrolled off your screen, but Rod Hunter has had his hand up for some time. Yeah, Rod is next. Yes, thank you, Stacy. wonderful presentation. Uh, you made a wonderfully interesting observation along the way that, that the teaching is um, in some way, at least implicitly, a subversive activity in a punitive institution like this. And I, it occurs to me that it really is a political thing that you're doing in a way. And I'm wondering how much opposition there is, uh, both in the prison hierarchy and also in the state legislature to these programs. Is there any organized opposition or is there much opposition at all? Or on the other hand, are there people advocating uh, that prisons need to be strictly and solely punitive in nature and should not be engaging in any of these programs? Um, I guess the answer is yes. Yes to, um, to both or all of your questions. You know, I could, we could backtrack a couple of years and, and I want to say that Governor Nathan Deal, um, he wanted to decarcerate and he also wanted to fund and really um, legitimately get behind prison education. And, you know, he was a Republican governor, but he did it. And if you um, were to visit or to look at Metro Prison in Atlanta, which is now the reentry prison, it's a model of what the Deal administration um, was able to accomplish. It's, it's, it prog it's as progressive as a prison could possibly be. Um, just in terms of the programming they're offering, they also use person-first language there. They refer to all of the men there as returning citizens. They don't use um, the word inmate or, or um, offender. They don't use that language. Um, so Deal was really behind doing it. But then with the new governor, as I was saying before, there's been an, um, like a 28% reduction in the budget for the prisons. And I don't know that Kemp is even thinking about prison education. Um, we, we're really looking at the Pell program, Pell funding and coalition building and consortium building as the answer to this because we don't necessarily see this money coming from the state or seeing the support coming from the state to do not in Georgia. And yeah, there's plenty of opposition everywhere you go. There are, there are gonna be many people who think that offering an education to incarcerated people is wrong or it's a waste of time. Um, so yeah, that opposition is out there for sure. But I'm not gonna say what I, what I think the current administration's attitude is because it doesn't seem to be a priority as far as we can tell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Tolly and Jerry Williamson? Yes, I'm Tolly. 
Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, be interested to know how you deal with the matter of grading and evaluation and how they receive uh, that as a part of their educational process. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So um, some information that I could provide along with the other resources I'll send is that I have now implemented something called ungrading. And mm -hmm. I started doing it because of the prison classroom. Um, many faculty that I, that I know, not just my prison colleagues, but my free world colleagues too, one of the things we admit to each other is that giving grades are the hardest aspects of our jobs, especially now because there's so much grade inflation and there's so much competition for these credentials and giving grades just is, it's hard and it doesn't feel right because the, the emphasis now seems to be on earning the points at the end rather than the process of learning itself. And so in ungrading in a writing classroom, what it means is that I don't assign traditional grades. I give the students the same feedback that they would receive otherwise, and they have multiple options for revision of an assignment until they're able to do all of the things that I'm asking them to do. Um, to use research skills, to be able to find sources, able to use sources, to cite them, to be able to provide evidence, all of the stuff that I want them to do in academic writing. And so it's a more labor intensive process, but it feels like it really makes sense. And the students have appreciated it too, but they didn't like it at first because we're acculturated to expect a grade to tell us something about ourselves. So it's a process or it's an approach that I've adopted and I have other colleagues in the prison program that are also interested in doing this as well. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. And then Spencer King. Yeah. yeah. I came in, <clears throat> I came in a little bit late and you may have covered this, but uh, is your prison a, uh, owned by the state or is it a proprietary for-profit prison? It's um, owned by the state. Lee Arendale is up in Alto, Georgia. If you ever are up that way near Baldwin, Cornelia, and you drive past it. Yeah, it used to be um, a sanitarium. Sanitarium, uh, uh, you know, it's Alto means high. So it was a little elevated. So people would go there when they believed that higher altitudes were good for health for TB patients. You can still see some of those original buildings. And it's also, um, it's been a prison for men and now it's a prison for women. Um, it's been there for decades. Yeah, I, I, I know it. In fact, uh, a neighbor of mine in Lake Burton has, uh, was a prison guard there for many years, mm -hmm. retired now. My question though is, how many of the prisons, oh, we got this massive prison system, how many of them are these for-profit prisons? How many of them are actually contracted from the state? Uh, because it, we, we, you say we've got more prisoners per capita, it sounds like, than any state. Uh, do, we, do we generate that many prisoners or do we import them from other places in order to stock our prisons? And I keep thinking that uh, the, D, the thing that Nathan Deal was trying uh, to decrease the number of prisoners uh, is, of course, interesting, but if you're in a number of counties, in particular in South Georgia, the leading employer in the county is the prison. So we've really created a kind of a, a prison uh, political complex here that's uh, a real problem, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is not an area that I focus on or study in particular. One thing I can tell you is that the problem of private prisons um, has come up a lot in the media in the last several years. And finally, we've been able to shift the narrative away from that because only about 7% of prisoners in the country are in private facilities. It's really actually a very small number. That doesn't mean that private prisons aren't a problem because they are. They're, they're a problem. But the total number of people in them is actually quite small compared to the um, total number of prisoners in the country. You know, we have about 
million people incarcerated in this country, in prisons and jails. Yeah, I, I was just uh, you know curious about the business of prisons and what was there any uh, because you talk about the the budget uh, being cut. Uh, I can tell you, I've had experience with prisoners who uh, who uh, basically are uh, uh, the amount of money spent on them in the prison is, is quite minimal, starting with food, uh, medical care, all sorts of things. There's uh, there's one over in Sparta, Georgia. I can vouch for the fact that uh, that uh, prisoners have died in that prison without uh, medical care, mm. uh, and uh, so these are these are the concerns I have. Yeah, uh, Stacy. One final question from Gretchen, since she her mic. She wonders to what extent uh, that you're able to work with others throughout the country doing this sort of work and get and share ideas with them in conferences, publications, and things like that? Oh, yeah, great question. So we have the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison. That's our professional organization. It's fairly new. It came together in 2017, although we've been having the National Conference for Higher Education in Prison for about eight years now, every November, but not this year, sadly. Um, and we also formed in the last two years what we're calling the Southern Collective. And this was those of us who would attend the National Conference, but we all represent programs in the Southeast. And so since March, we've been meeting very regularly on Zoom and we have formed the Southern Collective. We've created a steering committee and we're trying to figure out what it is we as a regional collective can do to promote this work and also to provide mutual aid, especially during this very difficult time. And then of course, here in Georgia, we have the Georgia Coalition for Higher Ed in Prison. We also meet regularly. I have colleagues doing this work all over the country. And, um, you know, I love the conference because we get to see each other, but we do work together collaboratively um, quite a bit and um, support each other. And it's, it's really important because I don't really have colleague, a lot of colleagues doing this work in, in my day job. So I lean pretty heavily um, on my prison colleague community for certain kinds of support. I hope that answered the question. So uh, Stacy, I just want to say finally, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's, really, it's really been great having you and, and thank you so much for, uh, for doing it and for uh, uh, keeping up through all these uh, Zoom issues. And now, uh, as our tradition, um, people can put their screens into gallery view and you can unmute yourself if you want to chat with anyone or if you want to leave, that's up to you. But um, see everyone back here next Monday. Thank you so much. This was really great. Um, I can talk about this work all day and um, it was really great to see some your faces. I am really honored to have been included in this. Thank you so much.